This is the last video on spectral analysis, and the topic here will be the pyridogram, or the discrete power spectrum. Now, if you recall, for the kth harmonic, the kth harmonic describes an oscillating function uh, with um, a sum of a cosine term with an amplitude a sub k plus a sine term with an amplitude of b sub k. And the, the superposition of sine and cosine function was also equivalent to a single cosine function, but with a phase shift, phi. Phi was the phase shift. We used a trig identity to show that this relationship, uh, show how this relationship comes about. And remember that a sub k is equal to a uh, cosine phi k. I, should, I guess I should write that as a the uh, a phase shift k and b sub k is equal to a sine phi k where phi sub k is equal to the arctangent of the ratio of b k over a k And a sub k was equal to the square root of little a k squared plus b k squared. And this is the, this represents the total amplitude of that spectral component or that harmonic. And this is true for um, k equals 1 to n over 1 over 2. The um, zeroth component amplitude is equal to a, little a sub 0 divided by 2. And again, that was our infinite wave number harmonic, or our infinite wave number component. And that, ha that was equal to the mean value of y. So the last video showed you how to compute uh, little a sub k, the cosine uh, part of the harmonic, and little b sub k. And once, we ha once you've computed a sub k and b sub k, then you can easily compute the total amplitude of this harmonic. And a periodogram is a, a function of a sub k versus the harmonic frequency. So you can you can show how the total amplitude varies with the angular frequency, or if you're dealing in a, a spatial time sequence, sequence that would be the wave number. Or you could what might be more intuitive is to show it as uh, just absolute frequency, one over the period, and the analogous. Uh, quantity for a spatial sequence would be 1 over the wavelength. And so I could, we can sketch our hypothetical periodogram. So on the bottom, let's just say it's the frequency of the kth harmonic. And we're plotting amplitude a sub k. And remember that the, the zeroth value corresponds to the uh, 
the mean value of, of y, and we may have subsequent values that vary however they do. And we may have some dominant frequencies or frequencies with higher power, etc. Again, displaying which harmonics have which uh, which amplitudes, and you can identify dominant harmonics. Now, another concept that I'd like to uh, convey to you is that these amplitudes represent the different um, the the variances of the total signal associated with these different harmonics. So a squared sub k represents the variance or the I guess the part of the total variance due to the K harmonic. So let's confirm this. So again, our best fitting function describing the sum of our different harmonics is equal to the zero har zeroth harmonic, our infinite wave length uh, or infinite uh, period signal, which is uh, just a constant, and that's the the mean value of y, plus the part that varies periodically about the mean. And the total variance is just 1 over n minus 1 times the sum over the, the whole data record of our model, or I guess each, each y value, minus or the deviation of the total record from its mean squared. Okay, so that's our variance. And so what we're looking at is the, again, the deviation from the mean. So that deviation is, is simply the part in this, uh, represented by the sum of harmonics. And so that is 1 over n minus 1 and times the sum over i equals 1 to n of the sum over j. And I can rearrange the order of the summation. So I'll put the sum over j on the second on the outside. Oh, and this and this term is squared. So if we were to multiply this out, you'll see that we'll have terms of cosine squared and sine squared, plus cross terms of cosine times sine. And you'll recall that because sine and cosine are orthogonal, it, the cross terms, when we sum over the whole length of the data record, those cross terms will sum to zero. So it's only the cosine squared terms and sine squared terms that will remain. And uh, taking the solution when we sum those over the whole record, we get simply aj squared plus bj squared times n over 2. Write these this cosine and sine squared terms when summed over the whole record. Uh, turn into n over 2. So you can see that our the, the variance of our whole record, our whole record being approximated by our best fitting function, is then equal to n over n minus 1 
over 2 times the sum over our all of our harmonics of simply a squared a sub j squared plus b sub j squared. And that's, uh, that's simply the sum over capital A squared. So you can see that the total variance is a sum of variances of each of the harmonics that we're considering. It's the sum of the variances associated with each harmonic. So n over 2 n minus 1 aj squared, is it, that is the variance of the j harmonic, the jth harmonic. And we can refer to that as s squared sub j, meaning the variance associated with the jth harmonic. And you'll notice that if n is appreciably large, then the variance of the jth harmonic is about equal to one-half the total, total amplitude squared. So by computing these different amplitudes and, and, their, and the total amplitude, we know what the amplitude of each of the harmonics that make up our function are. And this amplitude is proportional to the standard deviations associated with each of those harmonics. Now, in some cases, you can imagine it'll be helpful to test whether a power spectrum um, is uh, actually does represent uh, a periodic signal that differs from, from a random signal. And the test statistic that we will use is a G statistic, where G is equal to the maximum, the variance of the maximum uh, harmonic component. And that's divided by the variance of the full record. So when we look at our periodogram, we look at the period with the largest amplitude. And from that, we know what the variance is associated with that. And we divide that by 2 times the variance of our whole record, variance of y. And we can compare that to g alpha, which is our significance level at uh, n minus 1 over 2. And that's about equal to 1 minus the exponent of the natural log of alpha minus the natural log of n minus 1 over 2, all over uh, n minus 1 over 2 minus 1. So this is our critical Z value, G value. And if we find that our, our calculated G value, if G is greater than the critical, 
then we can reject the null hypothesis. that our signal is random. And, and likewise, we have to, if we reject the null hypothesis, we have to accept the alternative hypothesis that the dominant frequency is significant. Or we reject the null hypothesis that it's random and accept the hypothesis that there's true cyclicity at this dominant frequency, at the, the frequency or the harmonic with the largest amplitude. Now, the last concept I'd like to go over uh, just briefly here is the concept of aliasing. And aliasing occurs when we undersample. In other words, if our, our sample interval is coarser than the signal, uh, than the true signal. or um, let's see, our Nyquist frequency is uh, less than the frequency of the signal. So Paul Russell shows a diagram here where we have our, uh, we have a co relatively coarse sample interval, delta T, and uh, if we, um, you can see that he, here is a, a high frequency signal that is too high to be resolved by the Nyquist frequency. And so when we sample at this core sampling interval, we sample this true signal at different points. And what that, the effect of that is to make it look like there's a strong signal, but at the wrong frequency. It's at a, at a lower frequency. So aliasing describes what happens with undersampling when it converts a very high frequency signal to a, to a very low frequency signal. Or it creates power at low frequencies. that is artificial. So when you design your, uh, your instrumentation or your experiment, you want to have a sense for the uh, frequency range that's going to be important, that's going to contribute to your signal. And you want to make sure that you sample at a short enough interval su such that aliasing is not very strong. Because uh, that aliasing can, um, because it's artificial, it can map into frequencies that are lower and just and um, sort of inhibit the detection of true frequencies at, at, those, low, uh, at those low frequencies. So you want to be careful of that. Okay, so I think that wraps up our uh, total discussion of spectral analysis and discrete power spectrums.